So this lecture is basically on reading and writing a research article. So uh, these are all the terms that you know that we will cover it in this lecture. So let's go right into it. So when we are reading or writing an article, it's really important to make sure that your ideas are conveyed very clearly. And of course, when you're reading it, you want to really want to get the point where what um, basically what the the authors are trying to tell you okay and only from there you will be able to develop some ideas from the article okay so this is how um, scholarly ideas and how scholarly knowledge are kind of built upon from one another okay okay now so when we are reading we're, we're writing the actual article well you really want to make sure that the article that you are choosing is really, well, the one that you can really understand, okay? And so it's, you know, I really recommend uh, starting with something that is a little bit easier, uh, that is easier to read. Now, there are sections that are basically um, part of the, the research paper. And the kind of information that you're looking for, um, depending on well, what you're looking for, they will be falling in into one of these sections. Okay. Now, so the something that I like to do is I would like to, I, I like to think about research articles as like a movie, and in the movie, uh, you 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 basically you have something like the setting of the the movie where it's set at and where does it happen and then you can get like the uh the, the you can get the idea like where is it happening and, and the, the kind of zeitgeist that is happening and also in what uh countries and stuff. so this kind of give you a like a rough idea where what, what the setting is and then so the same thing is going on in research paper Okay, so let's talk about uh, this thing, the introduction. Uh, so the introduction is basically tells uh, the reader what, well, what it really tells, tells the reader like what is going on, you know, and what is the background that has been led, um, that, that's been pretty much conducted uh, so far. Okay, and then and then the introduction is also going to tell you um, what will tell the readers what the hypothesis is and what the research question is. Well, so the so generally they kind of introduce a problem, then they, they come up with a research question and then they're going to come up with a hypothesis. And then they're going to say something like and they're going to uh, introduce briefly what is going on in uh, the in the entire paper. So it, it's going to give you like some sort of foreshadowing of what's about to come. OK, now the abstract uh, is well, what is the abstract? Well, abstract is kind of similar to a preview of the movie, if you will. So the abstract doesn't tell you everything, the all the minute details of the, the actual paper. But it's uh, a basically a summarized form of the introduction, the methods, the results, and discussion. Okay, so it's a very kind of it's a, it's a it's a quick way of telling the readers without getting reading every single word in the rest of the entire article. It tells you what the paper is about. So a really well written abstract, uh, you should be able to read the abstract and get a, a, a gist of what this entire paper is about, okay? Now, the reason why it's called abstract is like, you're not giving up, you're not giving the whole farm away, you know? So, and also you don't give the entire punchline away when you are watching the preview of the movie, right? It, it defeats the purpose. So the abstract is um, written in a way that it's more abstract. Uh, it should be, but it should still give you enough information that you want to read the paper, that you think that the paper is interesting enough. Okay. Now let's talk about the method section. So the method section is something that is very, very uh, detailed and it should, 
a good method section is basically uh, a reader should be able to read the entire method section and will be able to reproduce the entire study. Okay, so it should be that detailed. Okay. Now the results section, so what is the results section? Uh, well, the, the results uh, section is basically tells the reader what are the actual findings of uh, the experiment or the study that came out from the methods. So the method section, you only tell the readers how you did it. Okay, the result sections, you just you, you're telling the reader what are the findings. Okay. Now the discussion section, uh, so, so the last part, the, the, the discussion section is really what um, the pretty much like the evaluation of the entire study. Okay, so um, that's the key word, the evaluation of the study. Okay. okay. Now choosing an article, it's uh, so selecting the right article may be the most important um, step because you want to make sure that you uh, want to find the correct article. Okay, and so you should be tracking down the study that you have heard or you have read about. Maybe you saw that on the news. Maybe a friend told you told you about it, and then you could uh, look through like the the table of content of the current journals, looking through the articles with interesting titles. And you can also use databases such as psychological uh, abstract or computerized tools like um, psych info. So these are all the, the methods that you can look for articles. Okay. Now we will get into much more in detail when we get to the third week on, on this. Okay. So the abstract is basically a preview of um, of the entire paper. And it should not be uh, longer than something like 250 words. It should be written in one paragraph and goes at the very beginning of the paper. Okay, now the introduction uh, immediately follows the abstract. Okay, and the, the kind of information that you are looking for are everything that is said here. It's a, uh, it should have a brief history and the background information. It should present the previous studies that has, that's conducted in relationship to your phenomenon of interest or your research question. And then it, it should provide the rationale for the study, okay, in terms of flaws or gaps of the previous research. And then you should uh, state your hypothesis and what do you expect to find if the findings are consistent with what you are proposing. Okay, and then you should uh, follow up with why your hypothesis makes sense. So, so introduction is basically all logic. Okay, it's is the, the there should be a very logical flow. Okay, and now, okay, and then the very last thing you should talk about uh, why your study is worth doing. Okay. Okay, now the next thing, that the, so the next section is the method section. So the method sections are the, what do you actually talk about in the method section? Well, you should talk about who participated in the study, so the subjects, okay? And you should talk about the design. Is this something like a, a independent group's design? Is this a repeated measure design? And things like that. Is this a single N, um, meaning one person design, like a case study? You know? And then there is the procedures. Okay, so the procedures is basically uh, the, the major part within the method section that tells the reader exactly how things were done. Okay, so that's why it's called procedures. So if you think about uh, methods as it's kind of like a huge recipe book that tells the, the uh, that, that tells the reader how to do the experiment or how to conduct the study. Okay, and apparatus and material is, so what kind of raw material do you need in order to uh, actually perform the experiments? Okay, now the results sections uh, is, the, the sim is the simplest um, part of the, of the entire paper. So it's, it's used purely for statistical reporting. So you, you talk about uh, whether the data were, were, were the results, uh, whether if it's significant or non-significant. And then you should also report whether if the statistics uh, support would refute your hypothesis. Okay. 
Okay, so that's that that's the only part I really should focus on. Okay, now the discussion section is more a little bit more flexible in terms of what you can uh, say in there. And then so it should have a interpretation and the justification of the results. It should uh, also have the explanation of the importance of the findings. And then what the next thing you should do is you should compare with the previous studies. And then you want to compare the strong point with, with the weakness of the present study. And then you want to talk about um, the future studies and what do you think are, are going to be really important. And then have kind of follow up with a nice conclusion, uh, uh, ending of the entire story. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. So those are the subsections of the entire paper. Now let's talk about um, the actual replication of the studies. Now, why do you think replication is very important? Right. So I, so I'll tell you why replication is really important. Well, it's really important in the sense that you want to be able to um, repeat over time and say that um, you know it, it's not a fluke in the sense that whenever uh, a person who are doing the replication of study, they will be able to uh, come up with exactly the same finding. And so this will be this kind of uh, replication. So this uh, a direct replication is exactly that. It's a copy of the original study. So everything is done exactly the same. That includes the number of participants. It might not be this exactly the same participants, but it, it, it should include like the same sex of the participants. If you, uh, if the original study was only males, it should only have males. And then if the original uh, study has only females, and then it should have, and they should have females, okay. And and even like the experimental settings. So let's say if the experimental settings were done in a laboratory with cubicles, then the direct replication should also be uh, conducted in a, a a laboratory with cubicles and things like that, and administrator paradigm. So 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 the point of the direct rep, uh, replication is to really establish the reliability of the original study. So uh, the idea is that if you are able to repeat the study, reproduce the finding of the studies over. Um, over and over and over again, it really brings the confidence that the original study is uh, reproducible, and then and most likely the original study is a valid and a reliable study. Okay, so that so it adds to the confidence of the original study, saying that yes, most likely uh, the the findings in this uh, what we found in the original study is correct. Now the issue is that if the if the let's say another lab who's doing a direct replication of the original study and they cannot whatsoever do like replicate the same result, well then there might be issues. There might be something that in the original paper that um, the, the, the that 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 the, the people who are doing the reproduction is having issues. They might have overlooked some uh, important details, or it may not, uh, maybe it was not written into the original manuscript. So that is going to be all issues. So this is why it's really important to have a very clear and um, reproducible method. So when other people are reading it, and when they are intending to uh, reproduce it, they can come up with exactly the same method, and they will be able to copy and reproduce exactly the same results, okay? Okay, now systematic replication is that this type of replication usually are only uh, differ in minor details of the original, of the original study. So, and, and this is usually to enhance the original study, okay? So if, for instance, they might want to have more participants, they might want to have more diverse samples, so, and they might have the more meticulous uh, experimental control. So these are all uh, aspects that can be, in, that's pretty much to improve the original study. Okay, 
So let's say, for instance, if the original study was only done in males in their 20s, and you are wondering if the, the same phenomenon can be applied to females as well, so you, in, in your um, study, you are including both males and females. So that would be a systematic replication. Okay, so it's really good to kind of, so, so this is good to establish uh, some aspect of the reliability as well as validity. All right. Now the last one uh, that the, well, was not the last one, but the, the 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 last type of replication is a conceptual replication. So, uh, so in this kind of replication, only the construct of the interest stays the same, but the measurement, the operational definition, the independent dependent variables all are, are, all may vary. So let's say. Uh, for some example, so let's say if the original study used um, was looking at whether or not ingestion of caffeine can really affect attention. So that was their, their research question, okay? And then the method that they did it is they would have people drink coffee, regular coffee, uh, and then they are going to measure uh, their attention, okay? So that but that in the conceptual replication, okay, study, what they wanted to do is they, right now, they don't care, they, they, they still care about caffeine and they still care about attention, but they want to change the way that caffeine was administered. So for instance, they would uh, change from drinking coffee to something completely different, but just uh, injecting caffeine directly into the bloodstream. Okay, and then the method they want to test the attention is also different. Rather than using an attention test, they are now going to use uh, electrodes into the brain that measures, that directly measures uh, this area in the brain that that's responsible for attention. So that, so you can see that the, the way of the, the way where the means by measuring attention is very different in the second study, even though that the construct of interest is still the same. Okay. Okay, and now how can you extend research? Well, there are many things that you can do. So you can add uh, moderating variables, you can add or manipulate uh, median variables, you can look for functional relationships, you can do studies suggested by studies um, authors. You know, so there are a lot of like other tips. Uh, you can look this in in chapters three and four. Okay. Okay. And now in the next uh, half of this lecture, uh, let's talk about plagiarism. Okay, because um, you are going to be start writing your uh, uh, lab report number one. And then I just want to make sure that you guys really know what plagiarism is, and that there is no such problem when it comes to um, plagiarize, plagiarism in this class. Okay, now, so deliberate plagiarism is stealing. So you, so because, so let's uh, let's define plagiarism first. Okay, so when you mislead the reader to think that the writing or idea is your own, okay because you fail to credit the source. It does not matter if you did it intentionally or unintentionally. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, this example of plagiarism. So this is the, this, so this is the fail, failure of citing. So up there, you can see that, you know, this, is, is this uh, source came from Postner in 1983. And then the student wrote exactly the same thing. Okay, well, this is just bad, okay? And because this is just copy word for word without giving any kind of source. So this is not allowed. If you do this, you will fail this class, okay? So please don't do this. Okay, and now another example of plagiarism. Now this is something that is more in the blurry line, but then if you ask uh, any um, scholarly writer, they'll still say that this is plagiarism, okay? So um, so up there, uh, you can see that detecting a present blah, 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 And then the students wrote 
pretty much exactly the same thing and then only wrote what that this source came from Posner. Okay, so this is still plagiarism and this falls the category of the verbatim copying without quotation. Okay, so when now this just, there's only one thing that I want to add for the purpose of this class, um, the SEC 213W, you should not quote direct ever in this class, okay? You should always rephrase it and then, you know, change the, what you, you should not change the meaning, but you should change the sentence structures to that it still means the same thing, okay? Okay, so, so this is exactly what I was saying before, you should not quote direct in scientific writing. Okay, so the only, the only part that, you, that uh, direct quotation is allowed in scientific writing is if you're saying something that has, uh, that, is, that you are debating and you're using someone's word against uh, or, or, or to support your point, okay? This is the only time that you should do, uh, quote direct, okay? But in scientific community, nobody does that, okay? Basically, nobody does that. So you should not do that. So we're just following basically that the style that is going on in the scientific community. So therefore, if you quote direct, you will lose a bunch of points. Okay, now, uh, so here is another, um, another type of plagiarism, okay? So up here, you can see that Poston wrote something up there. Uh, this failure to find uh, an ability to divide attention contrasts sharply with views arising from more complex tasks, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and you see it, the students wrote exactly the same thing, copying word for word, and then even um, gave the citation in exactly the same way. Okay, so why is this still plagiarism? Okay, because you are you are basically copying exactly what Posner wrote about these two studies um, that were conducted in 67 and 77. Okay, and this is still plagiarism because you are copying word for word verbatim, and on top of that, you failed to um, give the where you got it from because you, where you got it from is from Posner's um, paper you know even though there, he was uh, referring to these two papers okay so this is still plagiarism okay so don't do this either okay now the next example of plagiarism uh, this is too closely paraphrasing even with the source cited Okay, and now if you read this, you will basically see that this person substituted detecting, sorry, uh, detecting with noticing, okay, but then you see everything after this, the presence of, okay, and pretty much uh, substitute clear with a definitive singular in the other way, blah, 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 and then uh, substitute the noise free with non noisy. Okay, environment. And you can see that basically uh, the entire sentence structure is exactly the same, except just probably went to the uh, thesaurus and it just switch a few keywords. So this is still not allowed. Okay, so because this is too closely paraphrasing. And you can see that the entire sentence structure remains exactly the same. Okay, so this is still plagiarism. Okay, so don't do this either. Okay, so you're probably thinking, all right, so you told me so many things and uh, many aspects of what I should not do. So what should I do? Well, what you should do is you should completely write the sentence without changing its meaning. Okay, so, so up here, uh, detecting the presence of a clear signal in an otherwise noise-free environment is probably the simplest perceptual act of which the human is capable. So if you want to rewrite it, you should say something like, according to Posner, 1986, one of the easiest tasks involving sensation and word perception is to correctly register a signal when the surrounding is relatively quiet. 
So basically, you are completely changing the sentence structures while the meaning is still intact. Okay? That is how you should basically cite a source when you are trying to um, rewrite the entire meaning. So this would not be considered as plagiarism. Okay. Okay. Now, now you know that uh, what you should not do and what you should do. Well, how should you cite the source? Okay. When should you cite the source? Well, several. Uh, so this is just. Um, the, the golden rule of when you should do it. Okay, so you should do it when you are presenting specific facts. So if there's something that you're not sure about what, uh, so let's say if something that is not sure that this is a common knowledge, you should cite it. Okay, now if it's something that is like a very common knowledge that uh, almost everybody knows, so for instance, um, the uh, the Earth is the third planet from the Sun. That well, everybody knows this. This you don't need to cite it, okay? Uh, or something like the Pacific Ocean is the biggest ocean uh, body water on uh, 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 that's on the planet Earth. Well, everybody knows this. You don't have to cite it either, okay? But if something that's very specific, such as um, something like uh, let me think about what is a good Mm. Okay, so let's say if you are saying that, oh, um, there are over are, uh, 200 million people in uh, this whatever country that are uh, starving, okay, well, so now think about it, you cited a very specific number, and then you are citing a very specific country. And then you know, and then you you probably want to say that as as um as if the the as the year of um let's say twenty twenty that in this country um there are people who are in poverty and who are starving. So these are, are not uh, general knowledge, and then therefore it should be cited. Okay. All right, now let's talk about the second uh, aspect. Okay, so uh, you should cite when you are mentioning previous conducted studies. Well, obviously, because this is uh, a study that was conducted in the past and is relevant to your current study, so you should, you, therefore you should definitely cite it. Okay, the next one, when you are providing evidence to your claims. Well, the, I mean, so when you are saying that, uh, well, there is, uh, definitely very good evidence that uh, ingesting caffeine can improve attention. Well, you are saying that, so you just provide a claim, you're claiming this is true, right? So, well, where is the evidence to that? Well, you need to cite a study that has uh, suggested that in the past, okay? Now, the fourth one, when you are not sure whether you should cite it or not, so it's always a good idea when you are talking about uh, a very specific fact that you are thinking that oh, I'm not so sure if this is general knowledge, what is what what if this is a specific fact? Well, if you're not sure, you cite them. Okay, that's the easiest way to get um, get you out of trouble and stay out of trouble. Okay, that's it for this lecture and.